Christopher's girlfriend received a box of chocolates in the post one day. She didn't know who they were from, but they didn't look or smell right. It turned out that she'd been sent a box of chocolates that had been laced with rat poison. This is Red Rum. Stories about the true victims of crime. Jane Andrews was born and raised in Grimsby in Lincolnshire in the UK. Her early years through to her childhood and teenage years saw her become a troubled youngster. Although there are a couple of reasons as to why this might have been, some I'll talk about towards the end of the episode, at the time, her school teachers couldn't figure it out. Jane began skipping school, she developed an eating disorder and she experienced panic attacks. She also got pregnant and had an abortion, which she said traumatised her. And not long after that, she actually attempted to die by suicide. Jane struggled finding her way over the next couple of years to the age of 21, but in a stroke of extraordinary luck, her life seemed to completely change overnight. One morning, the newspaper was posted through Jane's front door as usual, but this time, a job advert caught her eye. She answered the job ad asking for a personal dresser. Jane was invited to an interview and after looking at the address, she realised that this personal dresser advert was for the Duchess of York, Sarah Ferguson, also known as Fergie. Jane was charismatic and charmed Sarah. The pair got on well and Sarah hired Jane to work beside her. She would become Sarah's number two, constantly attending big events, being inside her home and travelling the world for royal occasions. Although she was working full-time for Sarah, and that involved many, many hours and lots of travelling, Jane loved her new life. She was catapulted into a kind of luxury life she'd never known before. She was busy and worked long hours, but she still had time for a social life and took that very seriously. During her time working as Sarah's personal dresser, Jane met Christopher Dunn Butler, who was 20 years older than her. She and Christopher soon began dating, but Jane was crushed when she learnt he had a girlfriend. She was also wildly jealous when he didn't immediately break up with her and commit to Jane. Jane decided to take things into her own hands and planned her deadly next steps. Christopher's girlfriend received a box of chocolates in the post one day. She didn't know who they were from, but they didn't look or smell right. It turned out that she'd been sent a box of chocolates that had been laced with rat poison. It was soon after that, Christopher ended his relationship with his first girlfriend and did commit to Jane. The pair got married in August of 1990, and the next five years, Jane cheated on Christopher a number of times. The couple soon divorced, and then Jane met a man called Dimitri Horn. The pair never progressed their relationship further than boyfriend and girlfriend, but when the relationship did end a short while later, Jane was angry. She slashed his clothes and trashed the flat that they shared. Ultimately, Dimitri was so scared about what she might do, he paid her to leave. Jane became depressed, and over the following months, age 28, she did try to take her own life again, but she survived. It's alleged that after this, the Duchess Sarah Ferguson was having an affair with a Tuscan aristocrat. It's reported that this man also had feelings for Jane, and this was the reason for the next thing that happened, that would cause a downward spiral Jane would barely survive. After nine years of working as the Duchess's dresser, Jane was made redundant. The official stance of Buckingham Palace was that there was no truth in the alleged affair and the redundancy was purely a cost-cutting measure. Jane reportedly felt lost. Her entire identity had been ripped away from her. She again became depressed, but she did manage to gain a job in an exclusive jewellers just six months later. In December of 1998, Jane was set up on a blind dinner date with 39-year-old stockbroker Tommy. Tommy was English, but he had American parents. His dad was a multimillionaire and had worked building a hugely successful Ford dealership over his lifetime. 
Tommy took inspiration from his dad and worked hard himself. He became an extremely successful business person in his own right, not only due to his hard work, but also because he was a charming and charismatic person. Tommy loved the finer things in life, and this was something Jane was very attracted to. She was impressed that he lived in the expensive area of Chelsea in southwest London, an affluent area known for its smart boutiques and high-end restaurants. To Tommy's friends, the relationship seemed to move at quite a fast pace, but it did make sense. The chemistry between the two of them was undeniable, and just three months after that first blind date, Jane moved into Tommy's house. Although with this move, Jane became overwhelmingly possessive and jealous. Tommy wrote a letter to Jane stating that he couldn't cope with her jealousy and how he felt as though nothing he could do was good enough. He added that he felt as though he was walking on eggshells and that Jane's mood swings were hard to predict. He ended by saying he should be part of Jane's life, not all of it, and that he did care for her. One weekend, Tommy had headed abroad on a stag do for a friend of his. Jane called him continuously and when he didn't answer because his phone was off when he was on the plane over, she left him a whole load of aggressive voicemails on both his phone and on his friend's phones. While he was there, Jane opened up his laptop and started searching around. She found an email thread between Tommy and a woman in California that he'd met just a few months before. Jane read a number of messages. One of them spoke fondly of this woman's relationship to him. Although the email chain didn't outwardly admit to the pair having an affair, and ultimately Tommy did deny it, one email from this woman in California explained that she missed Tommy and that she thought he was addictive. Tommy tried to explain that the messages were never anything serious, but Jane was obviously devastated by this discovery. The couple argued and their relationship grew tense. Tommy really struggled with Jane's possessiveness and how she dealt with the discovery of these emails. He asked if she'd go to some kind of therapy or counselling, but Jane wouldn't go for it. Although the couple's relationship was still undeniably tense and difficult following this argument, as the next few days and weeks passed, Tommy convinced Jane to join him on a family holiday. They could go away together and at least try to forget about this. The woman on the end of the email chain didn't mean anything to Tommy and he wanted to prove that to Jane. Jane agreed and the couple prepared themselves for the trip to the Italian lakes with a number of Tommy's family members. Jane and Tommy headed off and in the back of her head, Jane was reportedly hoping that this would be the trip where he would propose to her. In contrast, Tommy was actually having doubts about the relationship. He thought he might have to end it over the coming weeks and months but he knew it would be explosive so he wanted to take his time to figure out how they could separate amicably. But even the Italian lakes holiday itself was extremely tense and difficult, with family and friends who were there speaking on how every day saw another argument or a fight between the two of them. The end of the holiday couldn't come more quickly, and whilst in Nice airport, the two had an extremely aggressive and emotional argument when Jane had stopped Tommy and asked him outright about when he was going to fully commit to her. When would he propose to her? But, having been given that provocation in such clear terms, Tommy was forced to be honest about how he'd been feeling. He told Jane that he wasn't ever going to propose to her. He didn't want to be in this relationship anymore, and when the two got home, they'd need to start the process of properly separating. This meant that Jane would have to move out of the house they shared, and the pair would go off on their own separate journeys forward. Jane was utterly devastated and shocked. She hadn't seen this coming. Things hadn't been great, but in her opinion, it had been a blip in their otherwise happy relationship. She hadn't seen this as the end of their relationship, and she was distraught. The pair boarded their plane home, and Tommy fell asleep pretty much straight away. Whilst he was sleeping beside her, Jane called the air hostess over to her. She asked for drink, after drink, after drink and by the end of the flight, she was quite drunk and quite angry. They both headed back to their shared home, where the arguments continued. Anyone injured? Not yet. And where is your other half? Right here. And what are they doing? Staring at me. Right, so they'd be assaulted anyone, sir? Not really. Mr. Clarence, yeah. what do you want the police to do? I would like the police to come and split us up. I would like somebody to stop us from hurting each other. 
because if right. we don't have somebody here soon, right. somebody is. The following morning, the tension was still brewing and the arguments had gone on and on. Eventually, Jane stormed out of the house and got into her car and drove off. Once Jane had left the house, Tommy called his friend to explain that he and Jane had split up. He told his friend that Jane had left the house earlier in the day when emotions were running high. He had to go to work, but he'd call back later on tomorrow and update his friend as to what had happened when he next saw Jane. At around 1pm that afternoon, Tommy left the house and made his way to the office. He wanted to do an afternoon of work to take his mind off of things before heading back to the house and having another conversation with Jane about how they'd move on from here now they'd decided to split up. When he arrived home, Tommy sat down on the sofa and tried to relax. He put on the TV and decided not to talk to Jane at that moment. It wasn't long before Jane left the house again. What he didn't know at that time was that Jane had been back at the house for a few hours previously and while she was there earlier in the day, she had taken a knife from the kitchen and hid it underneath her side of the bed. Next to the knife lay one of Tommy's cricket bats. At around 10pm, Jane arrived back home and found Tommy in bed. She crawled in beside him and pretended to fall asleep. She reached her hand down to the floor and felt underneath the bed for Tommy's cricket bat. She wrapped her fingers round it and pulled it out. Jane sat herself up on the bed and got in a position that was more sturdy before lifting the cricket bat backwards and smashing it down on Tommy's head. Jane then dropped the bat and reached back down underneath the bed to get the knife that she'd hidden earlier. With Tommy confused and possibly knocked out from the cricket bat blow, Jane took the knife and drove it into his chest. She pulled it out and drove it back into the same spot, twisting it as she did so. The medical examiner concluded that the knife had gone into his rib cage and pierced his lung and one side of his heart. The examiner concluded that this didn't actually kill him and neither had the bat blow to his head, although it had become clear that Jane had hit him so hard, his head had been broken open and his skull had actually become exposed. With the knife injury through to his rib cage, Tommy's lung was quickly filling up with blood and it wasn't long before the internal bleeding from that initial stab wound by Jane ultimately caused Tommy to die. By the Monday morning, no one had heard from Tommy. This wasn't particularly unusual as he'd often spend the weekends relaxing and resting after his long work week. But when Tommy didn't turn up for work and his colleagues couldn't get hold of him, the authorities were informed and they made way round to the house by the early afternoon. Officers forced their way inside and found a horrific scene. Before they could get into the bedroom, officers had to remove a tie from the bedroom door out to the banister. Once they were inside the bedroom, they found Tommy lying face down on his bed in a pool of his own blood. He'd been dead for days. It was clear that there was only one suspect in the officers' minds. They spent the next few days searching for Jane, who, after the murder, had taken her time to shower, get dressed, and then grabbed a bag she'd packed earlier in the day. She'd fled the house and headed across to the south of the country. Over those following days, Jane used her phone to communicate with friends. A number of those conversations were retrieved by police and outlined that in her own words, she hadn't done it. A manhunt was launched for Jane, and her ex-employer, the Duchess Sarah Ferguson, even contacted her and tried to get her to come home or turn herself in, but Jane was adamant that she couldn't. Jane's phone was traced from the cell towers it pinged on her journey, and it wasn't long before her registration plate was circulated amongst units in the nearby areas to where her phone was last active. Jane's car was located in a lay-by, and inside... Jane was found having ingested an entire packet of pain pills. Jane did survive, and as soon as she was well enough, the police took her into custody and began questioning her. Jane said that she'd only killed Tommy in self-defence after he'd tried to rape her. She said she'd been woken up by Tommy hitting her. She said she first used the cricket bat as she just grabbed whatever she could as a way of getting Tommy off of her. But, she said after that didn't seem to stop him, she grabbed the knife that just happened to be under the side of the bed and stabbed Tommy twice. She added that she didn't know if he was dead or not, and so when she ran and escaped from the bedroom, she'd used that tie to make sure Tommy couldn't get out and attack her again. 
this version doesn't account for the time that she had to go into the wardrobe in their bedroom, getting that bag that she packed earlier in the day, and then fleeing. All whilst, according to her, she was scared for her life. In 2001, the four-week trial took place at the Old Bailey, and because of the fame of Jane's previous job as a dresser for one of the royals, there was a kind of media frenzy at the courts. The prosecution presented that Jane had planned the murder, given the hidden knife, the time she'd taken before and after the crime, and the fact she'd stabbed him not once, but twice. Jane's defence presented the case that Jane was provoked into killing Tommy after trying to defend herself from him. At trial, the view of the psychiatrist instructed by the defence stated that Jane's depressive symptoms and hormonal status had affected her at the time of the attack. Jane also said that she'd had a terrible childhood. She alleged that she'd been sexually abused as a child and therefore had diminished responsibility for the death of Tommy. The jury were also told to consider other issues including accident, intent, provocation and self-defence. There were, however, a number of discrepancies in Jane's accounts and ultimately, all of those claims were refuted. Jane was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Jane appealed her sentence a number of times over the next couple of years, all of which were denied. In 2015, after serving just 14 years, Jane was released on licence. Three years later, Jane was arrested again, this time for an alleged harassment of someone she used to date, but she was released a year later because of lack of evidence. She now lives in her home county in Lincolnshire and has been seen working in a local shop stacking shelves. As for Tommy, his close ones will always be devastated by the loss of their friend, son and brother. And with Jane's release, they don't believe that they ever really saw justice for the murder of Tommy. Thank you for listening to this episode of Red Rum. If you like the content, consider clicking the thumbs up button. It really helps me out. And also subscribing if you're not already subscribed. You can also click the little bell notification if you want to get notified every time I upload an episode. We will see you soon for another episode of Red Rum. Bye.